Claire and I spent several days this past week in Atlanta doing some continuing education with some former seminary classmates. One of the many things we did during the course of this week was visit the Center for Civil and Human Rights in downtown Atlanta. It is an incredible museum on the topic of human rights, and it had several exhibits that were of particular interest. One of the most compelling things I witnessed was an inter interactive exhibit. It was called a lunch counter sit-in simulation. I sat at a lunch counter wearing headphones with my hands on the counter and heard what it might have been like to protest segre segregation at lunch counters in cities like Greensboro, where young activists who sat at lunch counters to protest Segregating eating, segregated eating spaces were met with violence and abuse and anger by white people. The simulation blasted through the headphones the sounds of those people yelling in my ears, using heinous racial slurs, breathing down my neck, and threatening all manner of violence against me. The seat shook and vibrated as though it was being kicked. It was disturbing and upsetting and emotionally painful. It only lasted about a minute and a half, but it left a lasting impact upon me. From that exhibit, exhibit to the numerous displays and examples of hatred recounted, it was painful to recall what human beings can do to one another out of hate. In his sermon on the plane, Jesus challenges this attitude of hate. With words that are familiar yet challenging, Jesus calls his followers to the most difficult kind of love described in the gospel, the kind of love that is not reciprocated, the kind of love that takes its toll, that which we offer to those who would harm us. These words can be difficult, not just because loving an enemy is a difficult thing to do, these words have been used by many a teacher and preacher to cause further harm to the victimized and the vulnerable. Jesus does not condone abuse. He does not tell the victims of abuse to remain in dangerous, hurtful circumstances, and neither do I. What Jesus does do is challenge his followers to adhere to a standard of love for all people, even those who hate them, even their enemies. In his Sermon on the Plain, Jesus gives what I think is the most difficult instruction in Scripture, to love our enemies. If we were to, in this space right now, write down a list of our enemies, of the people that Jesus is calling us to love in this piece of Scripture, there, we might come up with an, a list of abstract people, it might be easy to think of distant violence, distant enemies, such as members of ISIS or foreign spies or enemies of the state. Certain, certainly these people are included in the list of those whom we are called to love. But these examples feel so intangible. It is when we have concrete examples of these enemies that it gets really difficult. It's when these enemies are closer to home. One of my favorite stories in scripture is the sweeping narrative of Joseph, a small piece of which Elizabeth read a few moments ago. The piece of scripture she read comes from near the end of the story. As a refresher, Joseph, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, was violently betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery in Egypt. After many years of rising in the ranks in Egypt, he became a trusted advisor to Pharaoh, where he helped prepare Egypt for a great famine. When Joseph's family back in Israel immigrated to Egypt because of the famine, they found themselves at Joseph's mercy. In this moment of reunification, when Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers, those who had beaten him and sold him into slavery. He could use his power to imprison them or worse. But 
Joseph tells his brother, come closer to me. Don't be distressed or angry with yourselves. He sees their evil behavior as divine providence, God stepping in to prepare the world for its future. He promises to help his brothers. He cries on their necks. He kisses them. He loves those who hurt him. No judgment, only forgiveness. No humiliation, only mercy. No punishment, only provision. As Jill Duffield says, this story could have, should have gone so differently. But Joseph refuses to follow the typical human plot lines and does to others not what, they, what was done to him, but what he would want done to him. Joseph's enemies are those who were closest to him, his own family members. The enemies he was called to love were those he loved the most, those he shared the most with, and those who hurt him the most. This may be one of the most difficult kinds of enemies to love, not the abstract, distant enemy, but the one right here, close at hand. It is no new statement, no shock or surprise for me to say that those enemies we identify seem less and less often to be the intangible, theoretical, foreign militants. It seems that more and more in our time, the enemies we identify are those close to home, those in our own town, those in our own community, maybe even those in our own home with whom we disagree with whom we disagree. Those who voted differently from us, those who watch different news channels, those who end up on the opposite sides of almost every issue. Those with whom we once lived peaceably have begun to feel of late like our biggest competition. Those against whom we must strive. Those whose opinions and perspectives we abhor or despise or yes, even hate. It is news to no one, I'm sure, that the things about which we used to simply disagree have become these wedges that sharply divide us and keep us from engaging with one another. Confronted with these things, these issues, these parties, these opinions, we isolate ourselves. And yes, we even grow to hate one another. Given the words of Jesus, given the need for a cohesive community of faith, given the love that has been handed down from on high, this is a big problem. This summer, I will be taking a sabbatical for a few months. Some of you may already know this. During this time frame, I plan to spend time exploring this problem. I'll be doing some reading about the increasing tribalism and polarization in our world and in our communal lives. I'll be studying churches and groups of people that face division, and I'll be talking to other pastors about their experiences. My hope is to learn about how we, as a community of faith, can seek to break down those sorts of barriers for ourselves and how we can help the community around us and the world around us do the same. These divisions threaten the very fabric of our world. They threaten our daily interactions with each other and our ability to work together to make this world a better place. Which is exactly why I think Jesus' words are so important for us in this time and in this place. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Be merciful as God is merciful. As I walked around the Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta, I came across a large exhibit of the writings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. These were pages written in his own handwriting with his notes in the margins. Obviously, with such a strong prophetic voice, so many of his words spoke to me, but these are the ones that have been ringing in my head all week. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. 
Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Friends, our world seems to be falling apart at the seams. Our tribalism, our polarization, our differences, whatever you want to call them, push us further and further away from one another. And every message we hear from every corner seems to encourage these divisions. Listen to the ones with whom you listen to the ones with whom you agree. Ignore and avoid those with whom you don't. Silo yourself. Create a comfortable distance from those with whom you disagree. Those people are hateful bigots. Those people are racist elitists. Those people are dangerous. Fear them, hate them. For goodness sake, avoid them. But we hear a spirit. We are created by a God. We follow a Jesus who, into this cacophony, delivers a different message. Out of all people, we are the ones who are being called to do something different. We Christians are the ones who are being challenged. Don't hate those people. Don't despise those people. Don't even just tolerate those people. Love those people. Love them. Don't create distance between you. Step closer to one another. Those people that everyone is telling you to ignore or push away or hate, turn toward them. Love them. We're the ones getting that message. We're the ones getting that challenge. We are being called into the very work that person by person can change this world. So let us be about that work. Let us love where only hate seems to exist. Let us offer mercy freely. Let us do good to those who hate us. Let us do good to those who disagree with us. Let us do good to those who wish to see us defeated. Because it is only by doing these tangible things that we can help bring closer the kingdom of God. May it be so. Amen.